Hello and welcome to the final two modules for this semester in our media communication law, ethics and diversity class. Today we look at two modules together. First, I'm going to be talking about diversity in front of the camera. Then I'm going to be switching over to diversity behind the camera. To get the session started, here's a quick video that gives us a look at some new movements. It's a bit dated, but it's still very relevant to our discussion in terms of diversity in front of camera. NBC News Station and affiliate KCEN Channel 6 News has announced they are making history by debuting an all female, all black anchor team. Isn't that amazing? Let's put up their picture full throttle. I want people to get the full glory of this. KCEN is breaking boundaries. The team consists of Jasmine Caldwell, Tahisha Moise, and Ashley Carter, okay? Uh, one of the anchors said, and I quote, I just think back when I was a young girl and I used to watch the news with my parents and I never saw anyone who looked like me, said Texas Today anchor Tahisha Moise. If I did, they were outside reporting in the cold. Jasmine Caldwell spoke about how representation matters in news, said, and I quote, when I first came to KCEN in 2017, we did not have any African American anchors. It was completely different, said Jasmine Caldwell. I knew there was always room for an all black team of anchors, but I didn't think that I would see three African Americans, male or female, permanently at all at one time, no way. All right, beautiful stuff. Congratulations to those amazingly talented anchors because you better believe it. They earned every bit of what they are getting now. So big ups to you, all right, very proud of that. Uh, Dan, thoughts here? Not many, that reputation, that entire, the reputation they have, the representation that they are going to be bringing is super evident. And I just am happy to think about all of the little black children and all the black girls who are in the Houston area who are gonna be watching TV as their parents are getting ready or whatever. And seeing the black meteorologists, the black news reporters, all that stuff kind of around there. It's, it's these little things that really make a difference in media and seeing that yeah, of course, there are all this injustice that they're going to go into society, unfortunately. But there's also the silver lining that there are places where we can achieve and grow and thrive and make things better. So I'm I'm super excited and I hope this isn't just the first instance. And this isn't one of those cases where, oh, you know, we canceled after a month because it was a nice little experiment, right? Uh, this is something that you start to see at local news uh, and other forms of news just like around the world, especially around the country. That's right, and remember, it's normative to see an entire white newscast. That happens, that's a dime a dozen throughout this country. Um, but it's rare that you see an all black newscast. And this is definitely something for them to celebrate. And let me give them a shout out. Now, you can watch Monday through Friday, 4.30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. on Texas Today. All right, so that is just an example of the discussion that we have been having coming down to the end of the semester with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion their own reflective essays on how far so far in terms of where we are with diversity really feeds into the whole discussion around the black representation on mainstream media. What are your thoughts on that? It was really something that occurred, I would say in 2022, that's the reason why I'm saying it's dated. It's not that very dated, but it's something for us to think about and think through in terms of how change has been occurring in society, albeit incrementally. Um, to what extent are we seeing more colored people, more black representation, more black faces in front of the camera? Whereas, you know, years gone by, this was something that was unheard of as the testimonies went through the presenter on the Young Turk. That's a, that's a platform I usually examine, I review, I watch 
to get the critical analysis of what is happening generally in society. So that was just my way of priming you for us to consider what is happening fully in terms of who is representing um, what segment of the demographic. And of course, because we're talking about diversity, we're talking about those who are in front of the camera. Now, the images that you will see, it's still largely reflective of what is happening in society in terms of having an all white stance, even though we've had changes, like I said, incrementally. Uh, the image to the right is Lindsay Davis, who really has a very prevalent presence on um, ABC um, as, as, as one of the major stations. So Lindsay is actually there. Um, sometimes she anchors um, on Sundays, if you're ever watching the Sunday evening news on ABC. And then you've got Black journalists who have shared their stories. Uh, these are examples here of journalists who shared their stories during that particular very um, conflicting period of the Ferguson uprising, the Black Lives Matter movement, the George Floyd coverage. Um, this is Blaine Alexander who works for NBC. I admire her style and the way in which she handles her stories. She does a lot of investigative pieces. Um, this is Alex Perez who comes regularly on ABC News and of course, Rachel Scott, she reports um, from the Capitol um, a lot of times, um, things that are happening legislatively and stuff like that. And so if you read this particular article, you get a sense of how uh, this particular um, type of engagement works for people, um, those uh, Black reporters who are in the field, you will see the different types of tropes that were thrown at them. You will see the ways in which they had to dodge insults as a result of being Black or um, you know, mixed Latino. It is still this very black and white world that they're operating in. And so I'd like for you to access that particular article that I've posted um, in terms of the struggles. And I've pulled an excerpt here. I've put, pulled a little line here from the author of this particular article. Um, and he said that reporting while black in the United States can mean navigating a daily minefield. So for these reporters, sharing their stories really illustrates how they grapple with the presence of other people within the spaces that they function in who just don't understand that they're doing their jobs, but because they're doing their jobs in black skins, it becomes a very, very contentious for them. Now, Javita Moore, for most of you who would have been watching television, um, Javita, I think, passed year before the last. So this year is going to be the second year. Um, she was one of the major features or face, faces on Channel 2 Action News here in Atlanta. So um, very beloved individual. When she died, I was extremely saddened. But she held it down for, for, for quite a while um, as a major representation, Black representation of, of, of talent um, on, on a major station here in, in Atlanta. She really came from the North to the South but she was able to actually fit in very well as part of the team. Now your readings, um, they include the 10 year report in terms of the inception of GLAD's um, report, her scorecard from 2013 up to the most recent survey in terms of what does representation look like in the context of blacks as minorities or LGBTQ communities and stuff like that. Um, what they're saying in the report is that there's been more inclusivity by 50% in terms of LGBT representation in films, um, 1.5 times higher. So I'd like you to access these reports if you haven't done so as yet, to check the box in the report. And it will give you some stats in terms of what is happening in the context of equity and inclusion. Now in our daily lives, I'm sure that you would have encountered many people of various ethnicities and cultures, sexual orientations, and of course, genders, especially in cosmopol cosmopolitan locations like the Metro Atlanta area. But the fact is that the media that we consume do not always represent our diverse experiences. And of course, when they do, it is about reinforcing existing stereotypes about that lazy person or that functional home, um, or she must be not necessarily educated, um, or he must be on drugs. So these are the things that you will see when it comes to representation, but they're really misrepresentations or the furtherance of stereotypes, so to speak. 
So major stereotypes, like I said, will include black homes that are dysfunctional. And most engineers are men. She cannot be an engineer because women aren't engineers, all right? And then there's some of them that pass as just Asian women, you know, who drive, they don't have a sense of direction. Or Asians are usually human calculators. Why don't you ask Juan? Or why don't you ask, um, you know, Shim? Or why don't you ask, you know, that particular Han? Because they're Asian and more than likely they're very good at math. So we extend those stereotypes outward. In some instances, they come from media, but it's something we need to be very conscious of that we are fed with when it comes to our consumption habits. Even in films, in some cases, those particular stereotypes are infiltrated and they're extended toward audiences. Now, the Boxton report that I alluded to, it really gave an idea as to how many women are in the field. And of course, by platform, they're saying that women accounted for 27% of those who were behind the scenes working on broadcast network programs. And of course, 28% and then 27 on streaming programs. Now, women working in key positions behind the scenes in broadcast networks, so this has really stalled with no meaningful progress, according to the report, in the last decade. They comprise 27% of all creators, directors, writers, producers, executive producers, and editors, and of course, directors of photography on broadcast network programs between 2017 and 2018. And there was a 1% decline from the previous year, and of course, only a 1% increase a decade earlier, the period from 2006 to 2007. I'm not sure what the report says today, but I do know that it has not been substantial. So we have Joy, Bihar, Hall the Cobb, and of course, um, Cameron Hall, who has her own program here. So these are different, not Joy Bihar, I'm so sorry. Um, I forgot Joy's last name, Joy Bihar. She, she is one of the hosts for um, The View, but certainly not Bihar. But Hall the, um, you know, major network NBC, Joy has her own, program right now, not Joy, um, Tamron Hall has her own, own program, the Tamron Hall show, stuff like that. So you've got all of these women who are prominent faces, but it is not to say that they represent a massive shift in the landscape of, of, of what you see occurring in representation or representativeness of Black women in mainstream positions in mainstream media. So the depictions, um, you know, like I said here, you have a depiction of a family, maybe family guy, and whoever the family head is and stuff like that. They may seem harmless because they're cartoons and they're comical, but they have lasting effects in terms of what messages go out there for people. And as, and as we've discussed a few weeks ago, the media, they have the power, they're very powerful. They have the power to influence what we think and how we even think at times, all right? If we go back to the magic bullet theory, and if we go back to how we're actually primed to think a certain way, or we think about cultivation analysis, you become whatever you consume. Um, it is just really a part of the role of the media right now, especially since we have so many different online platforms and different levels and content available to people um, across multiple platforms. So, if we look at cultivation analysis, we see that Gerbner and Gross really spoke way back in 1975 about our heavy consumption patterns and the way in which they're likely to really shape our opinions on various issues. And so for this image here, it's about how do I listen to content of a political nature and how does that impact how I vote? All right. It's the same with social media platforms, you know, during the pandemic, there were quite a few persons, who were, quite a few people um, who were actually involved in spreading disinformation and forwards without even fact checking. But because you have segments of the society um, who may not be as literate, um, they're not checking against other sources. It is just as powerful an influence in them as if they were to feed themselves with the content coming through the television according to the arguments by the cultivation analysis theorists, Gerbner and Gross. Um, they found specifically that heavy TV consumers have an unrealistic perception of the world because certain things are highlighted more than others. 
So if they see the world as mean as a result of the television shows that they're receiving, then every particular interaction will be based on those particular perceptions that they have. It's like walking down the street or riding the train and someone decides to shift because the representation on the television says, don't trust somebody who looks a certain way. And so that's just their reaction to what they've consumed over time. Now, there's some implications for diversity in that particular perspective. Disproportionate minority underrepresentation really conveys what we call a non-existence in our society or that they make up a smaller percentage of the population than they actually do. So by really not necessarily focusing on the underrepresentation, it downplays the issue. It downplays that there's a lack of proper representation or recognition that there are other segments in society just as worthy to be acknowledged. Or there are other segments that require attention in terms of really highlighting the ills that are taking place in those particular segments. On the other hand, if you have overemphasis of certain characteristics of, of minorities, that will promote stereotypes among audiences who believe that every single member of that community share the same traits. And this is where you have um, this whole notion of, oh, so that person is Latino and they have a lot of kids. It means that every other Latino person really does that or that person is black and they're delinquent, they did not finish school. It means that every other black person that you see, they're likely to be a school dropout. So those particular types of emphasis on characteristics of one or two to represent the whole, this is really what we call hasty generalization. Um, if we look at the way in which there are arguments presented in the media that are illogical, all right? This may lead to both stigma and discrimination for groups. And these are the types of things that we hear distilled across political rhetoric when it comes to the election cycle. Um, like, just be mindful of your jobs because they're all going to come over the border and steal your job, or all of them are lazy, or whatever that particular stigma is associated with a particular group. And of course, the discrimination will continue unhinged. Now, again, if we're looking at minority representation, um, media scholar Cedric Clark, he studied the representation of minorities in the media and offered what is now referred to as Clark's model or the four stages of minority representation. First, Clark argues that there is what is called non-representation or outright exclusion from the media. How about that? Second, Clark says there is ridicule. Um, formerly non-recognized groups are shown on television, but they're shown as objects of derisive humor. Scorn, but humor at the same time. So how is that in terms of Clark's model? One time you're not represented and when you are represented, you are just an object of jest or humor. Then Clark says that there is regulation. Minority groups are represented, but in a very limited way in socially acceptable roles because Hollywood is forced to really embrace people who are not necessarily looking like those dominant figures on mainstream Hollywood in terms of it being an all white male cast, that particular power structure that exists in film, all right? But in limited socially acceptable roles, you might have black representation as villains a lot, and then that person becomes typecast. And so if you see them in a heroic um, a role or they're on the, on the side of law enforcement, it's either the characters killed off or they don't necessarily make a sequel. So there are pros and cons associated with these particular types of representation. Then Clark presents us with the, the fourth element of his model, which says that minority groups, um, you know, the, the minority group is presented um, in both positive, um, the minority group is presented in both positive and negative roles of everyday life, including interacting with children and having romantic relationships. And of course, this is an image from the series Blackish, where they're talking to their issues. Anthony Anderson, Lawrence Fishbourne, you have, um, you know, Ross and stuff like that. So it's this whole notion of we are part of society. We deserve a spot here in terms of the series. We deserve to be able to tell our own stories. So this is how you have respect playing out in the context of Black representation of a family that is not dysfunctional, 
and a family that can carry on a conversation that is intelligent and we can talk about our own issues because we have the wherewithal to do that. Um, now, there is this whole notion of groupthink as well that helps to problematize what is happening among other particular cultures and societies and minority groups. Um, this notion about Asians being problematic as Asians home to a diverse group of people and cultures, it, it, we just cannot sum it up as one word, looking at someone and say, no, that's an Asian person. They must be an immigrant or they must be all mathematicians. So this has gone through a non-representation phase. And of course, um, lots of people have been spending time ridiculing this particular group. Um, this image here, um, it's from a clip um, Aquafina has made inroads in Hollywood. Um, a representation is really something that is not necessarily rare for Asians, but there are one or two of them. That's the reason why the last award, the last um, academies, um, everything every year, it was a rare review that it received because of the fact that they don't necessarily, uh, they've never, some of them have never received awards in the academy since they've started acting. They've had a very long history of acting, but even the academy is influenced in terms of who gets awarded and representation or the lack thereof. So it's only in recent years that they've been depicted with some regularity and perhaps in rare occasions, some amount of respect. Now I'm thinking about this and I'm asking myself, what groups are still at the first stage. Can you think of any groups that are at the first stage in terms of totally being unrepresented, like they're absent from representation in, on, in, in front of the camera? Think about it, all right? I'm sure you can think about one or two instances. Um, so this is a graph representing minority mis or overrepresentation on cable, very dated. It goes back from 2011 to 2016. And as you will see, the minorities are at the bottom. Um, whites are way at the top there. And of course, the US population levels off somewhere in the middle there. So people of color accounted for just about 20% of the cable scripted leads during the 2015 television series, 2015 to 16. And that was a, an increase up from 15.8 in the earlier season, but it's still very low in terms of representation. Then we have this whole notion of race and ethnicity um, being a part of everything that we're seeing in terms of representation, but gender is also a factor when we're talking about diversity. So uh, people of different gender orientations or how are males represented or overrepresented than females? Is there a balance? So we've got Alison Bechdel who came up with a very crude way to measure female representation in the media, and this is what she said. In her comic, Dykes to Watch Out For, she proposed the Bechdel test, and the question that she asks people to look at is whether um, there are at least two female characters in the film, and whether they're talking to each other about something other than sex or a man. Um, she's also saying that, you know, if you're looking to see how females are, um, are they sex symbols in that particular film? Now, while the first test doesn't take into consideration the strength of the characters, we're talking about female characters, the importance of the character on their screen time, um, still over 40% of movies, it, it fails the test because of how they're being portrayed in the context of the male white, and of course, all the females are around. So many of the movies that pass the test either do not have meaningful female characters, or they still objectify women, and the example here is American Pie. Female directors have been opposing the male gaze and they've been saying that you need to make sure you're looking at the strong female characters in the context of how they're coming on screen. And we know that The Woman King and all of these other types of movies that have been coming out of Hollywood, they've been really making inroads in terms of what is happening and the changes that are occurring. Now, there's some movies that really do not meet the test, but they have strong female leads. Some examples are Gravity, Pacific Rim, and The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. The fans of Pacific Rim specifically were appalled that the movie failed the test, and they proposed an alternative test, which is called the Mako movie test. Now, what is that about? Now, according to the Batch Delta S, um, like I said, you have to have at least one female character who gets her own narrative. 
and that is not about supporting a man's story. All right. And this is a graph here that represents female versus male lead in the scripted show. Now, inspired by the Batch Del Test, a film historian and Black co-founder, Vita Russo, whose book, The Celluloid Closet, remains a foundational analysis of portrayals in film. This is how we see what is happening in terms of what Russo came up with. And Russo came up with a test for LGBTQ characters, and it was referred to as the Vito Russo test. To pass the test, the, 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 the Russo um, example says that it must contain a character that is identifiably lesbian, gay, bisexual, and or transgender. Russo's test also says that the character must not be solely or predominantly defined by their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, that is, they are made up of the same sort of unique character traits commonly used to differentiate male characters from one another meaning that there must not be a push to make them effeminate or to make their particular orientation so pronounced that people will always be associating their role with somebody who is actually of that orientation. They must come across as regular. Um, maybe whoever is casting should not necessarily cast with some sort of LGBT theme, but just consider the person for their strength and what they're bringing to the particular film. Um, according to Russo as well, the LGBT character must be tied into the plot in such a way that if the removal um, is, is made as a call by the director, it should not have, it would have a significant effect, not should not, it would have a significant effect on the direction in which the film is going. In other words, they're not there to simply provide colorful commentary or paint urban authenticity or set up a punchline, the character should matter in the entire film. Now, I'd like to ask you to think about how many titles you can name that actually pass this test, all right? It's just very difficult because in some cases they might have killed off the main character. Okay, so let us move now to diversity behind the camera. That's Ava DuVernay. Um, she is famous for the 13th and some other films. We've got quite a few up and coming directors who are behind the camera look like us. Um, their representation is really about minority groups and stuff like that, and they're women. Um, so the entertainment industry has quite a few. You've got Jordan Peele, Ava DuVernay, um, Ryan Coogler. Spike Lee has been a feature for a little while. Um, you know, Tyler Perry does not necessarily get kudos all the time because they're saying it's just too much stereotypical type of representation, but people still watch at his productions and stuff like that. And of course, the reason we're focusing on this industry, it's because there's just limited voice or decision making behind the camera. All right. As a result of bigotry and ignorance. And so different experiences by straight white men, um, women and minorities, they, they just lack um, the space to actually do so. And so because of that lack of accurate and just representation, this is how these particular directors have emerged to really give voice to the voiceless. Now, if you look at the Guardian um, article on diversity in journalism, it really highlights that disconnect that exists between community awareness and the coverage in the Bronx series of robberies. And it brought into question really the role of journalists when covering issues that they're unfamiliar with in minority communities. It's like thrusting or saying to someone who is really divorced from that community or experience, can you please cover this particular issue for me. And they go in there without having any experience or association with any person or member of that community. Uh, it's like sending somebody who's Asian into an African-American community. That's an example. Or somebody who's Caucasian into a black community. Um, and so what's the role of journalists when covering on familiar issues in minority communities? That's not to say that they can't learn, but it becomes problematic. And of course, the next question is to what extent does media coverage misrepresent or ignore the plight of minority groups such as Latinx and Black, all right? Do they, the reporters who go there who are not necessarily acquainted with or they don't represent that group, um, do they fully understand the issues in such a way that they are going to steer clear of the tropes that exist or the stereotypes in terms of their particular orientation or interpretation of the issues? 
And so some shortcomings that were highlighted in the Guardian is the duration of residents who refused to give up their money to save their lives. It's a bread and butter issue. And so the reporter did not understand that their failure to give up the money wasn't as a result of, oh, uh, we don't want change in the society. We do want change, but we've got to think about how it is that we're surviving if we give the money. So I encourage you to read that article. And so that ignorance that prevailed in terms of how the person misrepresented, they use quotes from experts suggesting that it was nuts for the people to do that. Now, if you went into the community, you would know that it was not nuts, but it was a matter of economics at that time. Now, the author of the Guardian article, who had lived in the Bronx before and was familiar with the demographics, offered a different perspective. This is someone who understands how the people live. And he said, and I quote, people who live in a rough neighborhood and are confronted with a demand for money are forced to make calculations that people in safer, more affluent areas rarely think about. The few dollars in their pockets may represent their only way to get to work. Surrendering cash is not only an immediate loss, but also one that jeopardizes the future of paycheck. So it's not about just saying I can donate without thinking about how I'll feed my kids. So that was the real oversight, um, the missed opportunity by that reporter who went into the community to talk about how Nazi considered the people. Now, the implication here is that in a lot of cases, reality is distorted due to lack of diversity behind the scenes. And so victim shaming, rather than conveying the facts on the ground, is invariably what occurs in many instances. So some statistics in newsrooms in terms of race. 2012 to 2016, more than three quarters of newsrooms employ non-Hispanic whites. And of course, those who work as reporters, editors, photographers, and videographers in the newspapers and broadcasting and the internet and publishing industries are part of this particular mix. And of course, 65% of the US workers in all occupations and industries will be those you know, types of people um, who are not um, that dominant group. Now, gender, race, and ethnicity in terms of how they account for the stats in newsrooms, um, more than likely a lot of males, there's still male dominance in newsrooms and six in 10 newsrooms, um, you know, 61% are male compared to 53% of all workers. And when you're combining for race and ethnicity and gender, half of the newsroom are non-Hispanic white men compared to a third of the workers overall. So there is that distinction or discrepancy that still exists within the newsroom as it relates to representation. And the disparity in the race and ethnicity really exists across all age groups, whether it's the millennial or the Gen X or the Gen Z, you will find those same figures occurring. And so non-Hispanic whites really are three quarters of newsrooms um, based on that report that I've referenced. And of course, this is 18 to 49, and they represent about 85% or so among those who are 50 and older. Now, the, the, the shares are lower among workers overall, but this is just a picture of what is happening in newsrooms. Now, statistics in newsrooms as, as it relates to the intersectionality that I shared with you, gender, race, and ethnicity, there are two major considerations. For newsrooms, diversity is a business imperative. It is about how can we actually leverage on these bases so that audiences can be satisfied that at least there is a bit of representation. So this is Lester Hall, the, the main anchor on ABC at the top, and David Muir, the major anchor, the main anchor on ABC's Nike News. Um, before it was Brian Williams, then you have Anderson Cooper who has a very big role on CNN. Um, and then you have Robin here. I can't remember the lady at the bottom, but these are some of the major faces. And if you look here, you will see four out of six are males, just two women in this whole mix. And if you look at the whole mix, you will see one, two, three in terms of blacks, one, two, three that are white males, all right? In terms of representation, you do have Addison Cooper who is of a different orientation, but we're not going to be talking about that. So because diversity is a business, there have been concentrated efforts to highlight diversity as necessary because they know they've got to reach all types of audiences and minority representation becomes very salient to who tunes in to the network in terms of the audiences, including those who are younger. Readers and viewers will invariably pay attention to the content that speaks to them 
or serve their identity. So that's the reason why diversity is something that they've actually been taking a close look at um, in newsrooms. Diversity is also a journalism imperative because this is something that they talk about. Um, while a without accounting for the range of lived experiences, um, we will fail to serve parts of our communities if it is that we're talking about quality and justice and equity and all of these things, because journalism in its truest form should be produced for the benefit of all, not only those who wield a particular power, class, or authority. So it's really a business as well as an imperative of the profession. Now, like newsrooms, if we look at journal diversity in public relations, um, the PR field also highlights the plight of underrepresentation. A majority of those who are engaged in PR are still Caucasian. And so, according to a Harvard Business Review by Angela Chitara, um, PR track director CUNY, 18 CEOs from the top 100 global PR agencies, um, 13 were uh, you know, men, five were women, 17 of those were white, one Latino. There was no consensus in the meaning of diversity and inclusion. It's, it's probably just a catchphrase. Four of them define diversity to specifically include gender diversity, while nine find it to include only race and ethnicity. So there is not a lot of attention in terms of this whole notion of women and the place of women. And even worse is the fact that most of the CEOs conflict with diversity with inclusion. And that's a whole different conversation altogether because you can have a diverse group, but whether they're included in the major decision-making, it's a totally different story altogether. All right. Now, a revelation in the report is that employees in PR who don't feel a sense of belonging leave by their mid-level career. And of course, most agencies admitted that they did not dedicate resources to building an inclusive culture. I guess now there are more efforts on the way to have these types of workshops that people feel team and they do team building exercises um, to get people to talk to each other and their issues, but there is still a lack of inclusion in a lot of workplaces where people feel alienated from the whole space. And so all the professions also face similar challenges. I'd like you to think about those as well because it's really something that is existing. It's not a fallacy. So some additional findings by Chitara is the fact that the ethnic makeup of the PR industry in the US is 87.9% white, 8.3% African American, and 57 Hispanic American and just a mere 2.6 Asian American. So this is what is happening in diversity. If you think that it's really bad in news, it is worse when it comes to public relations in the context of diversity. And there are some wider implications. This has to do with US census, which estimates that by two years or three years ago, just about 36.5% of the US population would be comprised of Blacks, Asians, or Pacific Islanders, or Hispanics, or Latinos, and stuff like that. So there's going to be an increase in these minority groups, yet there's not an increase in representation in terms of how they figure in front of the camera, behind the camera, those particular types of jobs here. It is just something that we need to be discussing and talking about in terms of who you go to for business or how belong people feel in a particular industry. Now, if our industry does not mirror the statistics, we lose that this is according to what they're saying. This is their major argument. Um, but the inclusion of these diverse groups within our industry can only add to the richness and diversity of thought, thereby bringing the best ideas to life and stimulating abundant creativity. And I'm saying our industry because as communication and media studies students who will go out there to work, you may want to see exactly how that company illustrates diversity before you choose a job, before you decide to go off and you're finished graduating, check to see whether there is a DEI policy of inclusivity. If there's a policy on the, the, the percentage of women who can um, actually apply for a job, check to see what percentage of uh, Blacks or Latinos they have on staff. And then you make your determination from there to see whether their particular articulated policy matches their practice, all right? There are some companies that demand that agencies reflect this diversity, but there is room for improvement to really see meaningful change oh, in the know. end of the process. So diversity in public relations, I'd like you to imagine the following crisis, a location that has to do the city of Hialeah in Miami-Dade County, 96% of the community identifies as Hispanic or Latinx, 
all right? They wanted a, a crisis communication specialist. Now the question is, who would be the, the best spokesperson to communicate with citizens um, on what to do and how to stay safe? And of course, research indicates that people prefer to hear news and information from individuals who share similar interests. So imagine going into a city, in Miami-Dade County, and you've got a lot of people who are Hispanic or Latinx. Will you send someone who is not looking like them? Are they likely to be seen as a credible source in terms of communicating with citizens and what to do and how to stay safe? That's a question for you to think about as you consider looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion in terms of who's in front of the camera and who's behind the camera. I do look forward to your EITN presentations, which will be uh, the culmination of our course, and it's been a pleasure working with you this semester.